Judicial System Discussion Part 1. And with us, we have <laughs> Ms. Gina Sirsion, our state's attorney, and then Mr. Kenny Shapiro. And I'm probably saying your name's wrong, I'm sorry, but Deputy State's Attorney. Um, please join us in the front. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the invitation. Hello. Hello. I love it here, too. Good to hear. You love it here too. I mean, everyone now has to start with that. You have to start with that. Now. Yeah, love with the enthusiasm. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Well, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um. Uh. I'll let you just well, introduce yourself. Well, we're invited. Um. I think this came out of Senator Quarterman's letter. And uh, we basically uh, we we accepted the invitation to speak to you to see if you had any questions. I think that there are concerns going around the county, but particularly the city, about the violent crime that is occurring. Uh, certainly, we've had two homicides within four weeks, um, both shooting, both downtown Hagerstown, one on Jonathan Street, and the other one on West or rather East uh, Washington Street. That was pretty shocking. Um, we're well aware of the concerns that the city has, and I think that uh, we work very well with, with the police department and the sheriff's department. Um, I think there are things, there are certain things that are restricting us. Uh, certainly, um, the laws in which we operate. Mm -hmm. uh, we do, uh, do prosecute these cases vigorously. I have 18 prosecutors, trial lawyers, including myself. Um, and I, I will personally be prosecuting the last two homicides that we had. And I think it's fair to say that this is not a nine to five job. Uh, and we do as much as we possibly can uh, to support the police and meet them where they are. And uh, I think our relationship with them is quite good. Um, the problems that we're having um, go more toward, uh, for the actual prosecution, is the um, availability of witnesses and the cooperation of witnesses. And I don't think this is something that can be fixed. Um, I think it's something that we deal with. But what happens is, um, often, to, oft times in uh, violent crime, if the victim survives, you would really be amazed at how often the victim does not want to cooperate or participate in the prosecution. And sometimes it's fear. Um, but certainly, we do have a, a we have a pretty big problem with that, and we have a very big problem getting witnesses to shootings to participate if we can even identify them. As you are aware, because you, you're probably paying for it, the city camera system is incredible. Um, the resolution is incredible. The, uh, the, the wide area that is covered is very, very helpful to us. And there, the, the last two shootings um, were actually on camera. The juries will be able to see these shootings as they occur. The problem is, um, hopefully we can identify the shooter, or if we can't identify the shooter, how are we identifying the shooter? Is this somebody that somebody w we put the photo out and somebody identifies them? Is it someone that a police officer has dealt with before and they can say comfortably, I'm familiar with this person, and then you have um, an identification. But we have to make sure that there's a strong identification and it can't just be someone calls in and says, I think this is the guy. What we would ordinarily do is uh, the police would ordinarily put together perhaps a photographic array or a lineup to say, is this the person that you saw do this shooting? Well, there's the problem because we can't get anybody to identify or to cooperate with the police. And as you know, anyone, anybody can walk down the street, a uh, police officer could accost them and ask, what's your name, uh, where do you live? And they don't have to give that information. And this is a problem that I've been doing this for 30 years last month and I, this has been an increasing problem. It wasn't like this when I started back in the 90s. People were more involved and really wow. more invested in uh, public safety and what we're seeing now is they, j they just don't want to be bothered. And, and there are other issues, you know, because of housing insecurity, people move a good deal. Um, they don't perhaps keep on, hold on to their phones so we can't contact them. We have a team of investigators, three right now, that go out and find just about anybody, and these certain people just can't be found. They don't want to be found. Um, so I think the first concern would be that um, if there's a suggestion that we are not vigorously prosecuting these cases, I think that what, what the public should know, and I've, I've hesitated to put this in the paper or tell Julie Green this problem, because I don't want potential witnesses to say, well, I don't have to show up, nothing's going to happen to me. That concerns me greatly. Um, 
but I think we have to acknowledge that we don't have cooperating witnesses, and that is very, very difficult. Um, and I don't know what the statistic would be, and I don't think that we've ever really looked at hard statistics. Uh, we have the same issue with domestic violence um, and the high percentage of, of witnesses or victims, rather, that do not participate with us. And, and there has been legislation to try to address that. I don't know how you'd legislate us out of the problem that we're having right now. Additionally, I know that there was a question in um, or a suggestion in the, um, the letter from the senator that we be prohibited from entering into what he termed as plea bargains. Uh, we call them plea agreements, and there are several reasons that we would do that. Um, first, first and foremost, uh, we have to look at the evidence we have in our cases, and sometimes we want to get something for very little. We may not have much uh, to go forward on, but we also know that we have a person who is um, a public safety risk, and we're going to get whatever we can. If it's a gun crime, it may be the only thing we can get from them is having the gun in their hands. And so we will push for a gun conviction. And then, again, we're limited by what the law says we can sentence to. And remember, we don't do the sentencing. The judges do. Now, we do that. We don't do that. They don't do that in a vacuum. And uh, we do make recommendations, and we have a very good rapport with the court. I think our re recommendations are usually fairly um, well received. Um, but uh, we, it, you know, if a gun charge carries five years, it carries five years. If it carries three years, it carries three years. What we've had to do in many of these cases where we don't have cooperation is reach a plea agreement in which the defendant uh, would perhaps plead to a, a serious charge, but rather than go to prison, we'd get our time on our gun charge and that person would go on probation, which sounds outrageous probably. But um, it's really possibly the only way to get some control. You know, we, we want to put folks in a position where they can move forward and succeed, and sometimes with the help of parole and probation, that can happen. Um, some folks are not going to succeed on, pro, uh, on probation, and that's, that's just the way that it is. Um, so when you hear that, that a plea has been reached, then um, what you can, I think, be comfortable in understanding is that my office wants the best for this city. Um, several of us live here. I mean, this is, I'm not from Washington County, but I've now spent more than half my life here, and this is my home. I want this to be a safe place. I want to be able to go downtown and go to a restaurant. I want to go to a ball game. Um, we're doing the very best that we can under the circumstances to uh, make this a safer place. Unfortunately, like the police, we don't necessarily um, pr prevent crime, we respond to crime. But we have ways in which we fashion sentencing and um, the fact that we participate in the <coughs> entry programs is that we're looking at this from both ends. We're looking at what happens when someone leaves the Division of Corrections, as you know, we have three prisons, and stay in Washington County or stay here in Hagerstown. What are, what are we going to do? Is this someone who's going to continue to have a criminal presence in our community? And that's where the reentry comes in and the services. And I don't know if any of you have, are aware of any of the services that we do here in the county. Certainly gatekeepers would be the first one that comes to mind. Um, we're seeing more and more people receptive to giving people a second chance. I work with this because I, after 30 years of locking people up, um, I see that that's not really going to get us out of our problem. And re reducing recidivism is, is very important to us. Uh, when we do take, a, a, again, a plea agreement, and this is not um, to suggest that we don't want to try cases. We're all trial lawyers. That's why we went to law school. We'd all rather be in trial or in a courtroom than sitting at our desks. Um, so it's certainly not for lack of interest. Um, we just, if we were to try every case, the system would grind to a halt. Um, every defendant is, is, has the uh, Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial. That would go right out the window. Um, but, but the pragmatic approach and the reason that we do what we do is because when you do a plea agreement, everybody has a guarantee. We have a guarantee that this person has a conviction, which might be very relevant the next time they commit a, an offense for guideline purposes, sentencing guidelines. We have a guarantee that there will not be an appeal. We have a guarantee of what the, the judge is going to put them on a, a term of probation. What does the defendant get? Well, they get a guarantee that this is the highest charge that they'll be pleading to. They get a guarantee that the sentence won't go above a certain number. Um, and the reality is of the situation is that we are forced into this situation 
time and again because of the lack of cooperation. Um, and uh, I don't want you to walk away or us to walk away and you think that all we do is plead cases out and plea bargain because that's not what we do. Um, we do uh, we do a tremendous amount of work to make sure that these cases are prosecuted fully with our own investigators, with extra work by the police department. Um, Mr. Shapiro is actually the head of the district uh, court deputy in my office, which is where most cases come in. He has a team of prosecutors who, again, work. Um, this is a 24 7 job and um, work hard for the cases as they come in. And then we have a team of felony attorneys who do the same thing in the circuit court. Um, we have been successful in uh, sometimes you need to take a plea to get someone to cooperate against their co-defendants, which is not a very popular person after that, but certainly um, in the, one of the most recent shootings, and I'm sorry, this, it hasn't been that recent, it's probably been about two years, and, um, and this, the name of the street escapes me, the one that we just had a successful conviction um, I can't think of the name of the street, but it was a Hagerstown City shooting. Four people were charged. Um, we had no evidence against uh, the fourth person. We didn't even know who that person was, but he was one of the shooters. And through investigation and through working with one of the persons who was charged, who was really just a passenger in the car, not the driver, not armed, that person was given an agreement so that he would testify against the shooter. So we got four convictions um, out of that shooting, and we had to do it though by working with what we had and creating uh, creating a case against who we knew was in that back seat firing a gun. And this was in the middle of the day, and I think uh, more than 20 rounds were fired. So certainly a very frightening situation um, with uh, a motive that you couldn't tell me what the motive was because so many of these shootings don't have motives. People are offended by something that is said to them. They're offended by something someone said about a family member. Um, the latest shooting, which was the one on Jonathan Street, my understanding is it has something to do with somebody messing with someone's car. But guns are so prevalent now, and this is how people are trying to resolve um, Conflict. their conflicts, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so what, we, we, we require forfeiture of guns in our pleas. Uh, we require them in our sentencings, and um, that's one way that we're trying to get the guns back from into the hands um, of the people who use them on the streets. Um, how to stop the flow of guns coming in, I don't know that anybody has an answer to that. But I know that the city, working with our, our prosecutors, they've done a tremendous amount of work having special task forces to, to go to, in that direction, the, the narcotics task force, has been very successful in, in getting guns when they do um, execute search warrants. Um, and uh, we're, we're doing the really the best we can under the circumstances we have. We do intend to uh, seek more attorneys when we go through the budget process again. Um, I can tell you, and, and uh, Mr. Shapiro is our juvenile court, juvenile court, excuse me, prosecutor, that our caseload has gone up three times. Three times. Now, wow. that's juveniles and that how long? in a year. In a year. We doubled and then we tripled. We doubled and And one, we have one prosecutor handling all those cases mm -hmm. at this point. Two reasons, I think, for this. Um, and one of them is legislative, and it's the Juvenile um, Justice, Reform. justice Reform Act, which has cut the teeth out of juvenile justice. And, and these kids know it. They know it. They know that they're not going to be committed. Yeah. They know that they're not only going to be on probation for six months, um, and uh, they're they're just committing all kinds of offenses. And Mr. Shapiro can tell you what what little teeth we have now in the courts. Mm -hmm. if, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, it's everything that Mr. Rincian said. So I I started prosecuting. You've been thirty, and I started in '97. I took an eleven-year hiatus to be a firefighter, and then started prosecuting oh, again. Wow. In the time that I was away, and to the time I've come back, the change in societal expectations of of the juvenile of, of not the juvenile justice system, but the justice system has completely changed. There is a general lack of ability or desire to participate in it, whether it's with our with our police friends as a job, whether it's as witnesses, whether it's even as 
You just need to make the microphone. Uh, make sure okay. people hear you, Ken. There you go. Or, or as prosecutors, and, and the public's desire to be a part of it, there is a, a level of mistrust in, in the system itself, and it makes it very, very hard as prosecutors to get the help we need to have the police get the help they need to help us prosecute cases, specifically to children. If a, when I was a prosecutor, my first go around, a <coughs> child could be committed out of the home for any kind of crime, and they could be committed until they were 21 years of age. Now the only kids that can get committed are felons, and I, and I didn't have a problem with some juvenile justice reform. Maryland was already on the more liberal end of things. We don't shackle kids. We don't do a lot of things. Kids are charged generally as children, except for the most extreme cases. But what we have now is we have children who know that if they are not felons, and even if they are, the Department of Juvenile Services has all but done away with commitments out of home. And even when we commit children, they come back to the same community they come back to, and the parents they come back to, and the friends. I can't, unlike adults, I can't tell them to find new friends and find new home. Kids are hard, but adults, just what Ms. Serencion is saying, is, is really, really challenging to drum up witnesses when they don't want to be dealt with and when they don't want to be a part of the process. No matter how serious the crime, and you talk about domestic violence, we have repeat victims of domestic violence whose meal ticket, their, their, their loved one, even though they, they are not good to them, that's who they rely on to support their family and they're not willing to step forward and help us. And it becomes the prosecutors explaining to them, at least the way that my folks do it, the district court is we try and remind them there's a difference between guilt and innocence and what they wanna see happen to that person who beat them or hurt them once we get to a sentencing phase and sometimes exactly what we're talking about here, we have to have one person involved in a violent, violent crime as the only person who will testify because they have a reason to testify because they would like to make sure that they suffer the least amount of jail time. We had a prosecutor in the office, just so you know how hard our folks work, who did, was on her third murder in six weeks. We try more cases in Washington County than probably per capita anywhere. We have more violence in Hagerstown and Washington County probably even more than Baltimore City. And we're, we want the community's help, and I know that the city police want the, sit, want the citizens' help, and I know that they get out of their cars and they talk to people, because I watch body cam footage of them doing a great job. But if I can't find these witnesses and victims, then that's as far as we can go as prosecutors, and we're doing our darndest, all of us, to make sure that we, we take everything seriously. And more than anything, and I field questions from victims every day, we are there for them. That's why we do the job. We're not, we're not doing it for anything other than the community and our victims. To the, but sometimes, despite wanting to do right by victims, we can't always do it because they just can't make cases sometimes. And as you say, that's, that's not something we want everyone to, to be aware of, but we can try to get these people personally served to make them come to court. But in the end, the hardest part for us is to sit in an empty courtroom and know that witnesses and victims aren't showing up. And hoping that they do show up if they tell the truth. <laughs> wow. Because that's another factor. And and they have their reasons. I, I, I will tell you that so the last thing I'll say is body worn cameras are, are I think the greatest things to have happened because if you watch enough of this body worn camera, you realize how good our police are. They they get thousands of calls for service and you can see how kind they are to the citizens and how much time they take. And there's always gonna be an interaction that doesn't work out the way people want. And when you see cell phone video, you're only getting a re real brief snippet, which isn't to say that everything that happens in interaction with the police are good, but they're doing a great job. And like I say, I watch hours of camera footage and they do a great job under the most stressful conditions. When I went in as a firefighter to calls, no one wasn't happy to see us. It's not the same in 90% of the interactions our police have with their folks. If they're having a really crappy day and things are about to get worse. When we showed up, things were generally gonna get better. They do the best they can with what they have to work with. They get us as many witnesses as they can, but it's interesting how a crime occurs and all of a sudden we become a ghost town. Wow. So I, mm -hmm. I just wanna let you all know that 
we are doing our best. I, I can tell you I field calls every single day about what goes on and I'm, I'm available and I know Mr. Enciona is available to talk and we're happy to answer any concerns or questions that people have. I can't always make people happy and I let them know that, that a lot of our calls don't always end in the way that people want, but we're doing the darn best we can and, and we will continue because every one of us in the office, all 18 of us are really committed to doing the job. Uh, otherwise, we'd go find higher paying jobs. We don't do it alone. We have a wonderful staff. The entire Wonderful. Um, and we do have, a, we have a, a committed bench, I believe, as well. And they work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Jeez, thank you for the incredible amount of work that you guys do. We're not looking for that. That's, we just want well, you to. I, I know, but what, what it helped do was even um, as things are, are shifting and changing mm -hmm. and all, you know, it just helped me to understand that missing piece, which means if people don't trust the system, then they won't trust the system even to keep them safe mm -hmm. at times. And so I think that I, I forget that. I forget that if you don't have witnesses, then you can't, you know, and so thank you for that piece. That was probably the most um, ding, ding, ding for me that, that I came think, off. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and we thank our police friends because uh, honestly, I, I'm, I can't say that enough. You watch enough body worn camera and you realize how much stress it is to go on a call where things are really, really bad and how calm these men and women are with victims, with, with witnesses and how much work it is to try and get information from people who are having a bad day. So I just want to applaud them as well because we couldn't do it without their work. And, and as Ms. Renzio said, our staff in the office is probably second to none. Mm -hmm. we, we're very fortunate to work with the people we work with. And um, we're not looking for, thank you, we're, what we're looking for is um, patience, I think, to say if you see something that looks ridiculous, a shooting that winds up being a gun charge and a reckless endangerment, which is a five-year misdemeanor, there was something wrong with the case. It wasn't somebody's lack of interest, meaning the prosecutor. Something When you see these things that look like they go, they just went sideways, it's something happened. And it was probably, as you said, a lack of, a lack of cooperation. Well, we didn't invite you because we didn't um, <laughs> believe that you guys were doing your job. Uh, we invited you because we think that it's important for the public to hear um, from the partners and that mm -hmm. there are things that this elected body can do, but then there's also things that we can do together and there's some things that we can't. You know, and so I, my thanks is on that because in my other world is, is mediation. And so being able to talk to folks about that, even in facilitating conversations, mm -hmm about how important it is to be engaged um, and how important it is just a neighborhood to, you know, see something, say yes, something. So please. that's where my thanks is coming from. And I'm sure um, council members will have some comments, questions mm -hmm. and, and for you guys. So first of all, thank you. As I said publicly the other week, you were the first individual to respond when I sent out an invitation to all of the parties uh, for the correspondence that only the mayor and council received. And the difficulty for me was that uh, that communication seemed to throw a lot of darts at a lot of governmental partners that are working constantly towards solutions, toward problems that we cooperatively manage. And so I appreciate when you said you manage crime, you don't prevent it. Mm. And I think I say that you know uh, a, a number of times through these deliberations. And so, you know, that communication seemed to simplify or attempt to simplify what isn't. And I appreciate your communication. I certainly didn't want you to come in defensive, but I, I think that the letter sort of like no, 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 makes you, no. like almost makes you come at it that way anyway, because you know what I mean? The letter sort of in, insinuates that, that those things are that simple. And so I appreciate you desimplifying Mm -hmm. what Do folks can look at it and say oh what's well, a simple thing you just you know <laughs> here's what you do and you apply the law and, and people go away forever but you know when you say things like and, and I think the public it's important for them to understand that you can't try every case you know that people have rights the cases aren't slam dunks that there is a constant lack of cooperation that they take a long time uh, and that there's public mit mistrust I mean just going through those examples of what you deal with Clearly, you know, don't make things as simple as the law reads on a piece of paper in a book. Uh, and so, so I appreciate that. 
I will say that there are two specific points in that communication uh, that I wanted to make sure we covered today. And for me, I want to make sure it's clear, as I've said from the outset, this is our effort to cover these topics of communication um, for the public's benefit. Uh, because unfortunately, in the age of technology and social media, we have gravitated toward, you know, uh, existing within that echo chamber of social media's uh, impression of how law and order and government and things like that work. Uh, and they just, they just don't. Uh, and so, um, I, you know, I'm glad that there's another individual that has been at this for some time, you know, in government in general, uh, to, to have that uh, awareness. But I think that you definitely covered uh, item number four, which was the subject of, you know, well, city, why don't you just tell the, the, the state's attorney to stop plea bargaining, you know, and, and you know, that, that'll resolve everything. Uh, but really point number three, I don't know that we got into, and so really when I read the communication, there's really two pieces here. There's the piece where we talk directly with you as the state's attorney's office. And by the way, the biggest thing for me was hearing that you have that level of staff, you know what I mean? And, and still that level of caseload that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, I feel that. So, um, but uh, the other point was what I'll call that, that second part, which is the lesser part. Meaning, in, in point number three, it, it says, well, you said, why don't you just talk to the state's attorney's office and get rid of the panhandlers and the trespassing and the disturbing of the peace, as if we can sort of like, our police can go grab those individuals and then bring them to your office and say, hey, take care of these people for us, you know, with, the, with these laws that, that, that we know exist and, and, you know, get rid of them. I mean, that, that's as simple as it sort of reads, and I read mm -hmm. that with just some level of humor and go, well, you know, it's no different than our conversation last week with the various uh, police agencies where I'm like, well, we work this every day. We already know that things don't work that way. That's correct. You know, so, so we shouldn't put out to the public a message that it does work mm -hmm. that simply because, you know, that, that, that's social media rhetoric. Uh, it, it's a lot more complex than that. And so the other part I wanted to hear from you today on was um, how you deal with those issues. And I think you touched a little bit on it when you talked about the change in state law for for the uh, uh, the JJ uh, the right, juveniles uh, reform act, and I, so I just wanted to hear a, just a, a bit on because I'm sure you deal with those issues as well the panhandling the trespassing and Disturb the disturbance of peace mm -hmm. and you know what I mean how you deal with that 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 sort of second layer of I don't know community misconduct. Can I defer to you since yeah, this I, is I, a district gonna, court? Yeah, I was yeah. gonna so okay. nuisance crimes and they're the biggest problem with any city because people want to feel safe going out to dinner to go to the ball game just what you talked about and we all want to feel that when I became a lawyer my father his lawyer said a prosecutor and he said you know do right and justice isn't always jailing for the maximum amount of time and district court is nuisance crimes run the gamut from you know 30 days to 90 days that we can put people in jail for and even if I jail these individuals who's committing the bulk of the nuisance crimes, even if I jail them for the maximum amount of time every time, they're still gonna be back on your street. <clears throat> they're still coming back. I can never, as a prosecutor, hit the core problems in your fund of saying that we don't wanna criminalize homelessness and, and poverty. Mm -hmm. We do the best we can to make the most repeat offenders no longer be around on the streets, because I certainly, I live in a city too, and I don't want to have people sitting on my porch or sitting in front of my house screaming all night, every night. The people in every part of the community here in Hagerstown, whether they're in the places where crime is most prevalent or least prevalent, deserve to live in a safe and quiet and enjoy their lives. And that's what we try and do in district court. But, but jail isn't the only justice that's available. And we need more help in terms of having wraparound services for these people. To, to provide some compassionate help. Uh, jail only does so much. And at a certain point, it doesn't provide a deterrence to the individuals who are doing it. And that's, you know, when we, when we prosecute, we try and have two things in mind when we craft settlements, pleas, whatever it is. 
We try and deter the public at large from committing crime, and we try and stop that individual. When we prosecute nuisance crimes, we try and get rid of societal to say that you can't do this, you can't act this way, but we also try and keep those people who are doing it from doing it again. Generally, those people are hard to, hard to deal with. We really have to work on societal deterrence because the people who are poverty-stricken or homeless, they're probably gonna have to keep on being where they are in the community and then we're not gonna help them. The, Just, uh, oftentimes, the, uh, they'll be arrested and by the time the case comes to court, they've already served the sentence. And there's nothing we can do. And I think that gets to that comment we often hear, and I think you sort of read between the lines here of that in, in point number four, is uh, our police have sort of stopped doing the work because they're tired of locking them Oh, up. I don't. And so I just want to sort of like get rid of that miss. Yeah, I don't think that's You know true. what I mean? That, I they, 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 they have not stopped doing the work. We have, misconception. you know, and again, not only do we have the officers who do the work, but they're kind about doing the they don't they try and get people to move along and to do the things that they want them to do without actually having to arrest because exactly what you're saying was which is in most cases even if they've already served the, that's in one end and also they often get booked into the detention center and they are out within a short amount of time and our officers six of them at a time on any given shift are already taxed enough with more serious things it's not that they're not trying to handle all these things but they have other calls for service that require their time and they have to prioritize which ones are first and not that i don't think that there's not i can't imagine there's a police officer out there who is not overtaxed and overworked and who wouldn't rather just be walking the street and talking to people to the community members and saying hi giving directions but it's really a challenge when there's just so many other things going on. When we are on our seventh murder for the year, when we are in the city, fifth, because, yeah. Please. Sorry. When we are doing other major things, and, and so I, they're doing their work. They're, they are doing their jobs. We have people who, I mean, they spend hours every day trying to keep the low-level crimes taken care of. And, again, we try and take them as seriously as prosecutors as they do. I think our bench tries to handle them with sympathy and with empathy and with a desire to not have them do it. Um, and, and, you know, those are questions and things that we have the laws in place to handle and we don't need to keep on writing more laws. We have the nuisance crime laws. Um, but in the end, I can jail them as long as I want, but we need to do something when they get out and how to help them maintain a sober life, a clean life, a, a housed life. That's the hardest part. I mean, like legitimately, it's not the prosecution. I can, you know, I can show that they were in front of a building that was said no trespass. I can prosecute that every day of the week, all day. It's not that challenging. The question is, is what do we do with them after they've spent 45 days in our jail and now they're back out? Yeah. I think that um, one of the things that, that looks, looks promising is uh, problem-solving courts and I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that we have a drug court here in Washington County we've partnered with Frederick County in the district court to have a veterans court and one mm. of the things that um, Judge Moylan Wright and I have talked about for years is a mental health court which would really yes. address so many I've always believed that needs to come before even the drug court but um, but the drug court's been successful and I think as we, we can build on that with more problem-solving courts but one of my passions and something I worked on before with Turning Point was a mental health diversion system. And I'd like to see that uh, expand into a mental health court. Um, and there are successful mental health courts in other parts of Maryland. And I, I think that we would be, um, we would be a perfect uh, location for something like that. It takes a long time to set something like that up, but the interest is really there. And that could address a lot of these nuisance crimes as well. So you mentioned two entities so far in your communication here today. The first, uh, gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, the first time that that entity came before the mayor and council here uh, some years back, and I just couldn't help but think as, as a person, a human being, you know, is, is this a gimmick or is this, you know, something that is, is truly going to, to work and I will tell you you know six years later seeing that um, discussion 
uh, from gatekeepers in, in a homeless coalition meeting. It's like, wow, this guy really gets it. He really sees both sides of this coin and what he's doing, we need more of. And so, you know, my human reaction was way, very different, mm -hmm. uh, as you indicate over time. And then you mentioned just now, turning point. And I, again, I think it speaks to the communication in this, to this communication we received, because while I wanted to keep the nonprofit portion out of this as much as possible today, when I hear you speak, you, you, you can't do that. You know what I mean? And, and there aren't so enough resources. For us, though, we're confused, I think, at times uh, when we read a communication that says the city should stop funding all nonprofits. And, uh, and you know, and I brought that up in, in one of the conversations I had, uh, you know, on, on the radio the other week is, what does that mean? Because there are 650 nonprofits in this community that do tons of different things. So which ones are you talking about? Because just in talking today, you've identified two that we don't have a great awareness of, but they're, that are doing things that you're saying are critical, you know what I mean, to, to, to what you're attempting to facilitate to address uh, um, the activities that you see. Cold weather shelters, a place for people to get, to get out of the elements in bad weather. Otherwise, they're gonna show up in business overhangs under their eaves. They're gonna show up all different places. Or our parks. Yeah. Well, so I, I run about four days a week downtown and I run all through City Park and around town. So yeah, I, I see it everywhere. And, and driving in, you can't not help but see it. it. It's gonna take a partnership of a whole lot of organizations, whether it's governmental or nonprofits or different groups because you can't turn a blind eye to all this and you can't think that we can just, like I keep saying, jail, jail people into compliance. That, that just, since 1997, that has never worked. Mm -hmm. there are, now I have two, two things to say about that. First, I don't know how many of these nonprofits are funded by the city. No, I don't, no, I don't. No, none. none. No. Okay, well that, thank you for that because I wasn't sure how, I didn't Six think seven. that they were. Well, but a lot of them are downtown. Right. So it, well, and the other thing is you have to have services where people who don't have cars can, Access them. So if I put somebody, or if a judge puts someone on probation at my request, that person has to be able to get to parole and probation. They have to be able to get perhaps to DSS. And so I don't know if that's as much move everything out of the city. I think that would be very difficult on the people who need those services. Um, but uh, I, I didn't know really. Uh, to what to think of that. Obviously, my focus in this letter was, wait a minute, you know, okay. I'm, I'm being called out, so let's see what I can do. Um, but uh, but all of these all of these things, it was it was very thought provoking for me to read the different concerns. Mm -hmm. I will say one more thing, it, just so that I can't leave this on, which is jail is appropriate, prison is appropriate for uh, plenty of people. I don't care about deterrence as much as that some people just need to go away because you're not safe. Those aren't the people I don't think we're talking about for nuisance crimes in general. The second part of this, right. Correct. So when, I, when our prosecutor did three murders in six weeks, prison was, was the end game. Like, that just is what it is. It, we, we send the message that that will never be tolerated, whether it's in the city of Hagerstown, the outlying area in Washington County. That's in, those are no brainers. The harder ones as I keep saying, are, are, are the nuisance crimes. And I don't mean to minimize them by calling them nuisance crimes because for the people affected, for the business owners, for the residents, they're not nuisance. It's, it's really affecting the way of life. Sure. So I, I don't ever want to minimize by calling them, but that is these 30, 60, 90 day max sentence crimes, disorderly in public, trespassing, even littering, you know, where, where we have people living under the bridge and taking all of their worldly belongings with them and not moving along, keeping you know, making it harder for people to enjoy the park or, or walk around downtown. So I don't want to minimize that. And I don't ever want to say as a prosecutor that jail and prison aren't an answer because they certainly are at times. Well, certainly, I mean, my first 15 years here was prosecuting sex offenders and children and adult victims. And yeah, that's, that's a prison offense. And, um, but and we have plenty of prosecutors who are more than happy to accommodate that as well. I, I want to say uh, some of my work outside of being the mayor has to do with mediation. And one of the things that we do is we go in, and I know I've had the honor of presenting to, to you, and I believe you were a prosecutor, um, and Judge Joe Michael was the state's attorney, yep. deputy state's attorney mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but one of the things that I do is I come in and say how much we save, right, because of 
the mediation services. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, knowing that you know mediation services within any area, any municipality, any county can help save, save the state money is a plus. But one of the things about gatekeepers is another, I facilitate for gatekeepers. Um, and they have 90 people sometimes on a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Most churches can't get 90 people um, in it. And you have 90 people that come there for resources. And one of the things that I just, I think that is very important for us to know is how much it costs for a person in our county jail and the re-entry around that. Mm -hmm. And Gatekeepers is doing the heavy lifting. So we talk about the three prisons that are state prisons here, but we have a county jail. Yes. And I work across the, the, the state of Maryland with municipalities and counties, and we're, we're few that still have the county jail mm -hmm. and the cost of that um, to have folks inside incarcerated. And then what happens when they come out and not having, whether it's reentry services or a supporting county. And so you have someone like Bill Gertner at Gatekeepers that does that heavy lifting for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to throw that out there because I know it costs $40,000 $40, a year for each person at the county jail. And if we think about that, if we think about that, I mean, $40,000 yeah, a year, a lot of money. I mean. And with the jail, these folks are coming home. They're coming back to and us. And they live here. And they yes. live here. Yes. It's a little different with the Division of Corrections, uh, although hmm. you don't do that. A, a many of them do stay here or become Washington County residents. But you're absolutely right. The cost is prohibitive. And, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Day Reporting Center and, and what they're doing with that group is um, that's that's money I think better spent in, that's right. to uh, to get f folks services and the treatment they need. Yeah, when I was a commissioner in 2010, I remember uh, deliberating on uh, you know operations at the county jail, and and you know there were a number of folks uh, of a conservative nature that were arguing uh, at that time. You know the the um, uh, the illegal immigration population was being incarcerated, you know, and so there was, there was an argument in, in this deliberation. And uh, I think at that time we had two individuals that were directed to the county jail as, as holding for uh, the state prison system at that moment. But then you look at the, the statistics and, you, and, and at that time uh, um, we had roughly 790 individuals that during their time of being incarcerated in the county jail had taken the GED, right? And only 10% of those individuals had passed for that particular year that took that test. And I, and I looked at the gentleman and I said, you're worried about these two individuals, you know what I mean? But there's no thought to you know, the bettering of the 790 individuals that weren't able to pass this basic test, you know what I mean? That, that addresses that issue on, on, on the backside of the reentry process or part of that uh, equation. And so I think that that speaks to, to that idea that, that we don't focus on that part enough. Like it's so. your parole and when people get out. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets out. Everybody gets yes, out. Then. That's right. Yeah. Everybody gets out. It's a very small percentage of people doing life without parole. So for me, the basic question is, what can we do to help you? Is there anything that the mayor and council can do in our position, as this letter sort of directs us to, to say, what can we do to help in the partnership that we have with you? Well, um, honestly, this is the first time I've ever met with anybody from the city. I mean, I've met the mayor socially several times, but this is the first time, um, and certainly you, um, Councilmember Perini, um, I've never, and this is, this is my fault, I guess, I never really thought about this as a partnership because my predecessor was not um, uh, involved, I think, with the city as much. I welcome this. I think this is wonderful because uh, we are going to we are going to need to add staff numbers. I mean, we like like uh, Mr. Shapiro said, this this one prosecutor who happens to be the other deputy, doing all these major cases within a very short amount of time. We need to give her help. We need to get more prosecutors in. Um, we need to deal with things like the excessive amount of body camera and the video and get uh, other every other state's attorney's office in the in the state including garrett county has a body cam unit we do not really? and uh you know, i think frederick um frederick has like eight people so we need to in, increase our we need to increase our staff and we don't um 
and there's a, there's a need for it. I think we'll be able to document that and justify that. But uh, since so much of the crime and it's, it's disproportionately in the city, um, I don't know if this is something that, that you could not fund us necessarily, but support us as we go to the commissioners. Well, I mean, an hour ago, I brought up that very question, right, with this letter when we were talking about our legislative request. And I said, hey, you know, what are the things in here that folks at the coalition level are going to lobby the state for this year? So it's good to hear from you what we can put on our list of legislative requests for the coalition to consider to take mm -hmm. down to Annapolis and say, hey, these folks need this item and we're asking for it on their behalf. This isn't a city specific item, but you know, we handle at any one time, we have almost 80 cases stemming from the Division of Corrections. Whether they're stabbings, whether they're weapons cases, we have a different load than almost, is there any other, any other county that Allegheny has? Allegheny County has two prisons, but right. we're the only one with three. And I uh, yeah, I think that we're the only one with three. So you're dealing with a lot of so cases from inside of correct. the correctional facilities. We prosecuted correct. everything that okay. happens oh, yeah, within absolutely. the division, whether it's having a shank or committing a murder. That's us. Yep. And and there is nobody from DOC who who then comes as a prosecutor. The attorney general mm -hmm. doesn't staff somebody in our office or somebody countywide. Just so you understand, again, that's 80 cases for a felony prosecutor is almost inconceivable around the state. It is a load so high that as to be unmanageable <coughs> for the average person. Well, in the county, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it's changed since I was commissioner, but I believe they absorbed some of that cost for the, the sort of transfer and, and you know, management of the individual when they come to and fro the, the court system, or if they've got to stay over at the county You're jail. You're talking about their house, right? State, yeah. doesn't, right. state yes. doesn't say, hey, here's, Correct. you know, here's rent money. They say, Probably sorry, not. this is on your dime. Yeah. Um, thank you, guys. I want to be a good respecter of your time. Um, uh, I actually. No, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't telling them the goal. The, okay. Like I was going to okay. ask any more Ladies questions, first. but I want to be a good respecter of your time. And so, if we could just ask the council any more questions, but knowing that they've been sitting before us thirty minutes. No problem. We're here. Yeah. Thank you for your time and your busy schedule, of taking time out to speak with us. Um, I had some pointers that you already touched on, so thank you. I was over here like check, check. So. Um, <laughs> with the drug court um, and mentioning mental health court. Um, so thank you for looking into that. Um, and the diversion program. Um, the youthful offender program that's in Frederick. Is there something similar like that here? I was, I was in Frederick as a prosecutor when that started. Uh, we don't have it. I know that Mr. Folio, who runs that program, would be happy to come up and help us, but that's another Couple position. Only. What did you say? I didn't Youthful hear you. Youthful Offender Program. The Youthful Offender Program. That's in, that's in Frederick. Um, it's a diversion program. So um, thank you for that. But is that a need here for a partnership or someone Before to come in? Before a child in? gets to me, they have probably been through one to four contacts with the Department of Juvenile Services, of which they've already been offered a victim awareness program, um, different programs to them. Would it be helpful? It would be helpful, but it's, I can think of many other programs and people like I really, that we could use before delving into that one. And it, because we're, we're, we are in juvenile prosecution again, I, I have a maximum of six months that I can have most of these kids on probation. The state has if not defunded the Department of Juvenile Services, they're certainly taking a much lesser interest in the most important population we have because I'm sure the reason you're asking is because if we can hit them early right. and, and make it stick, then then we don't have adult offenders. Like I totally exactly. appreciate why you would want to do that and I think it would absolutely help and it would just go on top of more things we need. Yeah, would it be helpful? Yes. Because yeah, some of these, we work with a lot of youth and some yes. of these kids that had experienced trauma and been through yes. things, end up growing up to be these same adults that yes. are committing these crimes. The so. recidivism rate from juvenile to adult is, is enormous. And it, would it help in, in every single way? It's frustrating. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I, I jumped in on No, you, you're the juvenile court person. <laughs> I, have, I don't know the answers. Councilman Brady? Um, I, too, would like to uh, say well, I know you're not here for a thank you for your service, but I'm going to thank you for your service anyhow. 
And thank you for being here because unlike this body where we conduct our business in public on television, um, you don't. And so coming here and expressing your thoughts, which I thought were done very well, um, is I think very helpful for the public to, to understand um, the issues that your office is facing um, and our community is facing and why. So thank you. Um, and while this should not be a, a political conversation, in my opinion, some of the genesis of this was politically motivated. So for the record, I'm just gonna point out that Madam State's Attorney, you are an elected official. You're elected out of the Republican Party and you bring a very, I'll, I'll, in my words, nonpartisan centric approach to making sure that the job gets done. At least that's, you know, that's what I'm going to say. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconception about, uh, as the Councilman Alshire said, about uh, what, what this body, what the mayor and council can, or probably more appropriately cannot do, and that is we don't tell you how you run your office. We, we don't tell you what to do, what to prosecute, and so forth. So again, pointing back to the genesis of this conversation, the letter from the senator, um, I think was uh, misleading at best. Um, having said that, um, there were two points, that, I appreciate all your points, but there were two that kind of jumped out at me. Uh, because of a comment that was made, um, unfortunately, on social media, which I don't really subscribe to social media in the sense that I don't pay a lot of attention to it, but every once in a while I see it. Um, and when talking about recidivism, you mentioned about locking people up doesn't always solve the problem. And I think Mr. Shapiro, you said uh, you can't jail a person into compliance, right? Um, yet last week, um, when we had a similar discussion, it was with the folks from the uh, Washington County Health Department about the harm reduction program and components of that. And unfortunately, um, the former Republican mayor of this city posted, literally posted on Facebook, lock them up, problem solved. To which my blood boils, uh, because that is such an ignorant statement to make. Um, so I appreciate your approach and the way that you look at things and that you, know, you have come here today to kind of set the record straight, if, if, if I could use that phrase. Um, for those who are you know, tagging on or whatever the term is, posting on um, social media and just piling on when, as Councilman Offshire has repeatedly <laughs> Uh, said, and I agree 100 percent, that um, it is, um, um, you know, inappropriate to um, have government to government relations on social media. It should very much be in person. So for multiple, multiple of times, I will again say thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I just find that um, as we go forward, and if you're interested in hearing more about law enforcement cooperation, stay, tune in next Tuesday. Uh, I don't remember exactly what time, but... Uh, I'll do it in my closing comments. Thank uh, you, Councilman. Okay, so tune in next Tuesday for that, um, and then it'll go on from there. Um, so uh, I did have one quick technical question. Um, uh, it, I'm wondering if... Uh, the, the, the crime, I believe it's still a crime in Maryland, of illegally recording a meeting um, is considered a nuisance crime or if it's more than that? I'm thinking the, the, the wiretapping. That's, wire yeah, tapping. I don't know that it's not meeting specific. It is, it it is, is audio recording audio without recording. consent. So mm -hmm. without two party, Maryland is a two party consent state. Well, what level does that rise <laughs> in, in the type of uh, well, now so you're putting me on the spot here, and I can't think of the penalty. 
Um, it's a misdemeanor. It's probably five. Okay. Um, yeah, paying but it is still time. a crime in Maryland. Yes, right? it, it is still a crime. That's great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, I thought again. you were asking to whether we thought it was a nuisance that somebody did it to. Got it. Thank you. It Thank happens, you. but if you would we like, get a lot of calls. give you the actual amount of time. That would be uh, okay. If you have a car, that would be absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all I have, man. Yeah. Or, sure. Or the restaurant. I board her. In the okay. I just have one question. Um, have either of you heard of uh, the anti-violence partnership Envy, Envy and Nevis Violence with Our Youth? Yes. Oh, I do know that. The children. Uh, yes, I, I have. Sorry. And unfortunately, when they meet, um, I'm in court. Yeah. And and that's it's it's a shame. I, there are things I I miss because I'm in court. But I am aware of it. And I, are you still are you part of that? Yes. Do you still meet downtown in we the do. dance studio there? In the yeah. It well, used of. to be a dance studio. Yeah. In the borough box. Yes. yes. Um, then so, uh, hopefully we'd like to sit down, there. not necessarily with a meeting, but to mm -hmm. kind of explain what the partnership is and. The, um, the mission for the youth and its prevention and re With kids, we have a like lot that. of leeway to, mm -hmm. to things we, sentences, the word we use for sentencing is the disposition. So we will, I'm happy to listen and do. Yeah, I can school. send you some. He might be the better person so. to be involved. It's well, on the, two, it's usually Tuesdays, right? I'm around on Tuesdays. It, it Does varies. it vary? There's two different. Yep. Oh, okay. I, I'm two happy different to go and I'm happy to listen because like I said, just like with the Youthful Offender Program, resources are lacking yeah. and we're happy to our court would be happy to give them different resources options uh, so i, I can yes. tell you i'd be thrilled here <coughs> i'll, I'll reach out to you and maybe Please? you can schedule yep. thank you absolutely um i just had a, a couple of quick things if that was okay um first thank you for the clarity it really helps i mean i think those of us in the room have a maybe a better understanding but um for for the citizens that are watching this, it really helps to, to kind of take down the curtain a little bit and, and understand uh, some of these things that aren't really public knowledge or aren't really just common knowledge. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask if, if you guys would mind to clarify, because if, if I wasn't in this role, I wouldn't know, right? I wouldn't know. So I, I think the, most people that watch this may not be aware of this, but uh, drug court, you know, that that is a, a really uh, important tool um, and and I don't know that a lot of people are aware of that and then I heard you mention uh, veterans court um, in partnership with Frederick and then a possible mental health court um, what type of alternative as to uh, alternative to locking somebody up um, would those courts provide and I, I know the answer to drug court, but if, if mm -hmm. you wouldn't mind ex kind of expanding that a little bit for well, everyone think, else. Well, I think if I can look around, we I do think judge, have, judge, we okay. do have Judge Wilson, and that is his program. Yeah. Okay, so, so that might be more appropriate judge. than yes. for, yeah. for um, just um, Yeah, I won't, I won't steal his. <laughs> as far as the veterans program, um, Mr. Shapiro is going to be working with that. Um, so he would, I don't know how far along we are. We're, we're up and running. Okay. We, we are waiting for people. You know, and that's going to bring in just a multi-systemic group of, of teams VA can help obviously since you know but I'll tell anyone here who doesn't understand a problem solving court the, the goal is with with carrots and sticks with with incentives and and punishment to try and not send somebody to jail or to prison who otherwise may go so they start by admitting what they've done that's that's the first part of any problem solving court is the admission so the the pleading of guilty so just so anyone understands it there because i'm sure that the lock them up mentality is is they should all be locked up that that's the beginning and so if they don't follow through in their problem solving interventions that is that's the ultimate consequence but in the things like the va or a mental health court the idea is to to, to match needs with resources and there's generally you know, it, we know from years of folks having served World War I on that it takes its toll on you. Even the folks who don't serve abroad but who do high stress training, it presents its own set of problems for people. And so the goal, at least for the Veterans Court, is to utilize the community and a lot of VA help to try and get these people what they need. A lot of, their, a lot of the roots of their problems is, is from trauma. It's, it's, it's either actual or, or perceived trauma, but it's all the same in their mind the person who needs it. And so with Frederick, we will, again, it starts always just 
because that's the most important thing everyone understand. It starts with the admission of guilt, and then we work on the problem solving. Does that kind that, of answer? That's perfect. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. Thank I you very I much. I think that people need to understand that. First. Yes, sir. Thank you. You guys have any more questions? I think we've had you on trial long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for letting Thank us come Thank you so speak. much for all the Thank work you. you do. Thank yeah. you. I hope the book comes out really well. We'd like a copy. Oh, gosh. We'll make that happen. For the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of down there to shoot your office. Thank you. I mean, with a camera. Like like a camera shots. I'm sorry. I didn't want that to. Oh, my God. Can you imagine a sound bite? Oh, God. Help me. Chief, I need help. Uh, judicial system discussion part two and with us we have the honorable judge Brett Wilson I don't think I don't know if we're allowed to clap for judges or anything. I think we're supposed to stand up we're supposed to stand all right raise your right hand thank you I was at this point in any court saying I was running we would ask if anyone needs a comfort break. But a comfort break. Like we don't get that. A comfort break. Yeah, we, gotta do. we don't get this. We should write that in. Don would have to give snacks. So. Yeah. But getting two periods of public comments with no comfort break. Up there. We just did one minute, man. Is there, do you have an extra one? Oh, did I run out? Good for you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What I've handed out is just our state of the court report from last year. Uh, this year's will be done in October and we'll submit it and we'll make sure to electronically send copies over to you as well. Thank you. It's just a year after year report that's uh, required by the state judiciary to let uh, the Chief Justice and the Judicial Council know uh, how their courts are doing. And so especially after COVID, uh, they're rather interesting reports as you can imagine. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I, I was glad to receive the invitation from uh, Mr. Nice Warner and to come here and, and with some limitations on what topics I can go into, I'm glad to explain better uh, the judicial system generally and of course our circuit court uh, of Washington County. Uh, for the record, my name is Brett Wilson. I'm the administrative judge for the circuit court for Washington County. I've been a judge for almost seven years now and administrative judge for well, a week shy of three years. The um, court system in Washington County, I can tell you, is strong. Uh, we do need an additional courtroom for our district court. Uh, they have been one of the longest suffering, overworked pair of judges uh, in the state of Maryland. Uh, it's my understanding that, that finally uh, there's been a log jam that has been broken, key log removed, and now they are back on track to hopefully get that additional courtroom constructed within the next year, year and a half. Uh, it was held up a significant period of time with fights over the initial contractor uh, that, that I don't think it actually made it to court, but it was very close to going to court until they were able to free themselves from that contractor and can now go forward. The uh, Circuit Court for Washington County has six judges and one family law magistrate. There was discussion earlier about the number of cases that come from the prisons, and that's one of the reasons that we have six judges uh, for the number of people that we have in this county. Uh, per the number of judges is decided by the caseload. Every year there's a caseload analysis done across the state. That caseload analysis is then sent down to the legislature and they may or may not grant new judgeships based on need. There's a formula for it. I'm not going to go into the formula. I don't really understand it, uh, but I know that it worked out in our favor to allow us to, uh, to add a sixth judge in the recent past. The uh, process for criminal court, because I understand this is primarily about criminal court, is somewhat hampered in Washington County because our courthouse is old and out of six courtrooms and one magistrate's hearing room, only three can be used for criminal matters. Uh, as you know, we need a secure courtroom for criminal matters. Anytime there's a person in custody, uh, there has to be a secure way to the holding cells. Uh, most of our, all of our judges on a daily basis walk the hallways to get to courtrooms because we do not have uh, very many back safe courtroom or, or courtroom walkways from chambers to the different rooms. The um, 
problem with only having three secure, secure courtrooms is that we can only do three criminal matters at any, in any one day, or if there is a, uh, a sinner proceeding or a juvenile proceeding or a family law proceeding where one person is incarcerated, one of those courtrooms has to be designated for that case, which often limits us to two. The uh, process for criminal matters, uh, they talked about a little bit before, I won't go into any detail, uh, but obviously almost all cases originate in the district court. They come to us uh, by a couple of ways. One could be an appeal where there's a conviction uh, that is disliked by the uh, litigant. There is the jury prayer where a case that does qualify based on the potential sentence uh, gives the person a right to a jury trial. They can pray a jury trial instead of disposing of the case in district court. And then also by way of criminal information, criminal information is a document that's filed by the state's attorney after there's been a preliminary hearing in the district court. Preliminary hearing is purpose to find probable cause or not on felony charges only. Uh, the grand jury would do that role uh, for cases that are presented to it. This county has a strong history of not overworking the citizens of Washington County and grand juries, where some counties require grand juries or even two grand juries to sit on a weekly basis. Uh, this county has generally always called them in either as needed or on a monthly basis because it is a six month uh, term of service. And obviously that can be very difficult for a citizen to accommodate. After the cases come to the circuit court for Washington County, the, uh, they are then put into uh, various type of criminal scheduling. What we've done, one thing we have changed since COVID, because there is a higher number of multi-day cases after COVID than before, and that's largely because of additional questioning and additional distancing and other things that, that COVID forced us to do. It just took longer to pick juries to get cases resolved. Uh, so to go forward to limit the number of useless court dates that would be set, uh, we asked the state's attorney's office, and they were glad to accommodate, to put in a memorandum with any newly filed case that would indicate if, in fact, they believed it was going to be more than a one-day trial. Uh, we've been very successful then at, at limiting the number of court dates being set that couldn't be used because the case couldn't be concluded, and then through scheduling conferences, getting those cases scheduled in a, a very timely fashion. Uh, you may know there are two different types of speedy trial issues that we deal with the circuit court. Uh, there is the statutory uh, Hicks rule, the 108 day rule most people hear about that originated from a case of that name and then was codified by the legislature. That is a hard date of six months whereby the only time a criminal case can be continued beyond that for trial is upon the administrative judge signing a good cause order finding that the reason that the case couldn't be concluded in, in six month period uh, justified a good cause finding. Criminal, or I mean constitutional speedy trial rights, that has to do of course with the Bill of Rights. Generally, the Supreme Court has set down a 14 month period before you get to constitutional dimension. Now that's a long time. Uh, and we try our best to resolve criminal matters within the Hicks state much less uh, before the 14 month uh, speedy trial right would come about. Many cases, uh, there's, there's nothing you can do to prevent that. However, there, there are oftentimes issues of criminal competency which have to be resolved before a case can go to trial. And that can require months of uh, evaluation by the Maryland Department of Health. Getting of a report, perhaps a public defender or defense counsel hiring their own expert holding a trial or holding a hearing on that issue and making a decision before the case can then be reset for trial. Other reasons for long uh, continuances come about oftentimes from the evidence. Uh, if it is a case that requires DNA analysis or other uh, high technology issues uh, to be resolved, that can back up because we can't do that locally. You know, you have the Western Maryland Regional Crime Laboratory that's been here for decades and housed in the Hagerstown Police Department. They have always been very prompt and effective in getting their work done, but they're limited in what they can do. They can't go into the biological sciences. You can't do the DNA there. It would be cost prohibitive to do it. So we rely on the state labs for that. And it's just because of the need and demand across the state, we can get backed up pretty far. Same is true with uh, a lot of the uh, technical issues with downloading cell phones and going through digital analysis. What we can't do here, obviously, delays cases as well. 
Overall, though, we've uh, gotten back on track where our numbers are essentially the same time-wise as was pre-COVID. There was talk of a COVID backlog or COVID glut uh, that we resolved in very quick time, especially in civil and family law matters and criminal law matters are now being scheduled as quickly as they were beforehand, in some cases quicker, uh, just through some tinkering that we have done. I did bring some statistics for you just so you can have uh, a better idea of the numbers of cases we handle. I, one thing I, I do with our MDEC or Odyssey statewide court system, we can very effectively set it up to run reports for us so we can not only see data but see it compared year after year. So this is comparing 2023 through 2024. It's a year-to-year uh, -year comparison and month-to-month. At this time in this year, there have been 224 criminal informations filed and there have been 37 criminal indictments filed and a total of 366 criminal cases filed overall, those including all the other things I talked about from motor vehicle to, to appeals. Uh, that's as of July 31st. The number of criminal informations filed this year is actually down about 50 from last year, down exactly 50 from last year as of July 31st, and also criminal indictments are down by 10 compared to last year. At this point last year, we were at 456 total cases. Uh, if that trend continues, we'll be at about 627 criminal filings in the Washington County Circuit Court uh, for the calendar year of 2024, all of which will need to find a courtroom at a resolution. The, uh, just a little more, I know it's been running behind, so I'll just give you a couple things and then gladly answer questions. And I think this is important overall, and I'm going to skip ahead in the criminal process to sentencing, because that is one of the issues that I read on Facebook and elsewhere and is always one of the uh, hot topics for discussion, uh, but also for, uh, I won't say misinformation, but just ignorance of how the system works. I'm going to read the following, which is the guideline from uh, a Maryland Court of Appeals case before it became the Supreme Court of Maryland that gives us directive in every criminal sentencing. A judge is vested with very broad discretion in sentencing criminal defendants and is accorded this broad latitude to best accomplish the objectives of sentencing, punishment, deterrence, and rehabilitation. A judge should fashion a sentence based on the facts and circumstances of the crime committed and the background of the defendant, including his or her reputation, prior offenses, health, habits, mental and moral propensities, and social background. A trial judge may base the sentence on perceptions derived from the evidence presented at the trial, the demeanor and veracity of the defendant gleaned from his various court appearances, as well as the data acquired from such other sources as the pre-sentence investigation or any personal knowledge the judge may have gained from living in the same community as the offender. A trial judge's discretion is limited only by the constitutional standards and statutory limits. The ultimate determination must not be motivated by ill will, prejudice, or other impermissible considerations. Now with that, many people have heard of the Maryland Sentencing Guidelines. They are very different than the federal sentence, sentence guidelines. Matter of fact, they aren't even related. Federal Sentence Guidelines are proscriptive, meaning they are intended to keep judges' sentences within certain boxes. They are not based on historical data. Rather, they are set, as set up by the whims of the legislature and the regulators who then create them. Maryland sentencing guidelines are a very different animal altogether. They are a look back provision that is meant to educate not only the public, but the judges of Maryland. They were set up to be derived by an analysis of a certain range of years over the past few years and then taking the 60% of sentences that fall within whatever range. So if we take 100% across here, this is the 60%, that's what the guidelines range would be. They are then used to educate the judges by being sent out and by being required for the judges to consider the guidelines in every criminal sentencing. They do not hold any requirement that the court must apply them. They are advisory. 
However, in filling out our, our sentencing guidelines forms after trial, if we do depart from them, whether we go higher or lower, uh, they do require us to put down the reason for that. And the purpose is simple. They want to know what's going on, right? If we depart because someone entered into a drug rehabilitation program and we depart lower, they want to know that. If they depart because there is something particularly heinous about this person's crime, could have been the affect that, that the person gave or the lack of any remorse uh, at a sentencing, that wants to be noted too so that the powers that be in the judiciary understand why judges are doing what they're doing system-wide, and also it can identify problems or solutions for sentencing uh, if there are issues. I think finally, uh, it was touched on a little before, and I suspect to be questions, so I'll wait and then take them then, but we do, as a courthouse, we have initiated many programs that are directed solely at not only uh, trying to break the cycle where it's, a, it's it, where it can be done, but also to reach out and make our courthouse and the justice system as accessible to the public as possible. In addition to the adult drug court, we also run a family law clinic. We recently expanded that from one day to two days uh, per week, and that is a program where grant money is used to hire local attorneys who are willing to come in and serve as family law clinic attorneys. Here, all matters that come in that day to give advice uh, to people who cannot afford their own attorney to help them navigate the system. We have three local judges who, uh, who have offered to serve in that capacity. We rotate them around. They do a wonderful job. Uh, a few years ago, I, I initiated a family, or not a family, I'm sorry, a self-help center in our law library. Our li law library was uh, being underused with the advent of the computer. Of course, the need to go to a library to read a book uh, waned. The law library was space that we had uh, that could be help, use, utilized to help additional persons. We have a, a great number of persons who represent themselves in family law and civil matters due to their inability uh, for financial reasons to hire attorneys of their own. The Help Center was devised uh, by the Court Access Committee, which, which I now chair. I did not create the Help Center. I came aboard after the fact. But learning about the benefits it could have to a community, uh, we were able to partner with the Administrative Office of Courts and install our own help center, uh, which now also has a help center manager as we were able to, for the first time in Washington County history to hire a law librarian who both uh, handles the law librarian as well as the help center. And we were able to do so by simply converting a pin that we already had uh, from a position that we was empty, but we did not believe we needed to fill as such. And with the help of the county commissioners, we converted that into a law librarian and help center manager. Those programs help us to uh, stay in touch with the people that we serve, which is all the people that come before us and those who do not have a need to, but benefit from the efficient, effective, and fair uh, application of justice. So with that, I'll gladly take questions. Any questions? Questions? Uh, good. Your Honor, thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, we appreciate your time. Um, I, I have two questions um, that were kind of identified in the previous conversation with you. I know you were here, here in the audience to hear. Um, and the first is um, just for everyone's clarification. Um, uh, since you are the chief judge of the circuit court, tell me what input does this body, the mayor and council have in, in um, telling you how to run your court? Well, none. I mean, none. the- uh, That's, that's the, what I was looking for. No, I know, and yeah. I know you're looking for something. The, yeah. It is paramount to having a system of justice that can be respected by the people that re we remain impartial. Uh, other people pays our salaries, okay? Other people build our buildings. Other people keep us safe. But in spite of all that, if we do not maintain that distance uh, from even the appearance of impropriety, the whole system fails because the public loses faith and our, our directives, our decisions mean absolutely nothing. So, anyway. Um, on a more kind of forward-looking uh, question, um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, Councilwoman Burnett commented on it as well, um, of various 
uh, referred to as problem solving courts. Mm -hmm. And I know it's my understanding that courts in larger jurisdictions maybe have more resources for more of that opportunity. Um, uh, what was mentioned here was uh, uh, veterans uh, by the state's attorney, veterans courts, mental health, uh, youth services, and um, and I know in other counties there are uh, specific uh, 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 judges assigned to like senior citizens issues or medical malpractice issues or what have you. Um, but I was wondering if you could speak, as was touched on before, a little bit about the success of the drug court in Washington County, which I understand you had a hand in, in, uh, in establishing. And I've had the honor, mm -hmm. the short per period of time that I've been on the council, almost just, over, just under a year, uh, of, of visiting uh, three, I believe, graduation celebrations, which uh, my takeaway from each of those um, has been that those individuals um, might otherwise either be, you know, incarcerated uh, for life or long time, or dead, quite frankly. Um, and here they are starting their lives over again. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about that a little bit, if you would. Well, briefly, yes. After becoming a judge, uh, then administrative judge Dan Dwyer asked me to um, try to begin a drug court. With you have to understand the specialty courts in Maryland or problem solving courts in Maryland uh, all originate in Annapolis from the administrative office of courts. They have an office of problem solving courts it's run by Gray Barton, who has been to some of our graduations, uh, who is a phenomenal person and has overseen the significant growth of problem solving courts across Maryland. I think we now uh, number in the 60s, where when he came on board, it was more in the teens. The problem solving courts are resource intense and that's one reason that uh, you just can't have them all in every jurisdiction uh, there is a, a generally small population that may qualify for participation in drug court but for that person that participant uh, it may more than, than change your life it saves a life uh, I have no doubt that there are people that have come through the Marshall County Drug Court that would be dead now uh, but for their willingness to attend. And I say willingness because it is a voluntary program. You cannot order someone into a drug court program if they do not want to go in. That would be a waste of resources. Uh, you know, the old adage of it can't lead a horse to water. Well, I mean, that is true. People have to want that. At the same time, they have, they have a motivation to do it because all of the persons who come in are in the criminal milieu. They are facing charges either in uh, violation probation hearings with backup time on sentences or new criminal offenses that are hanging over their heads. Mr. Shapiro is right. The way that we run our problem solving court, our drug court, is they have to plea in, meaning you have to either admit your violation of probation or you have to plead guilty to whatever you and the state work out to. And then we do what's called pre-sentencing supervision. So the sentencing continues to hang over the participant's head until they complete it. A lot of people, uh, a lot of defendants, will not enter the drug court even though they would otherwise qualify because it's a minimum 15-month program, and they know that 15 months is only if you are a perfect student. Uh, we've had two who have gotten through in the minimum time period, and they seriously were perfect students. Uh, perfect students and perfectly uh, applied themselves to improving themselves and finding a path to sobriety. Same time, we've had people in for four years. We have one for over four years who it looks like may not ultimately graduate, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but the, the, the motto I have with someone who voluntarily enters drug court and makes uh, efforts is that, um, you know, we won't give up on you unless you give up on yourself. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to kick someone out of drug court um, unless it gets to a point where they are clearly a negative influence on others or back in committing additional crimes that endanger the public or in some other way clearly show no uh, impetus to complete. Uh, and that, that's about it. The, the drug court numbers are relatively small. We've been at a high in the 30s. We've been at low in the 20s of participants. Our, our graduations may be one, it may be six. 
Uh, it, it's, it's a moving number because, quite frankly, there are people who get close to the end, and, and whether it's, it's getting a little too enthusiastic before they're out or they just uh, have too much pressure and can't succumb to a relapse, but we don't remove them from the program. We put them back a notch, and we encourage them to continue on and graduate the next time. So that's what a, a drug court is and how we run our drug court. Uh, it is, like I said, it, we would love to have more participants, but it's a, a, a function of them uh, coming in, being allowed in through the state attorney's office, and then also uh, them being willing to commit themselves to what is an intensive program. Why do you not, why are there not more? I mean, what, what is the alternative if they don't go into, if they don't make this decision? Well, it goes through the, can be jailed, depends, it goes through a sentencing. It'd be, it would, it would otherwise their case would be processed in the normal course. Uh, maybe they are maybe they have a trial, maybe they're found guilty, maybe not, maybe they plea, maybe something else happens, uh, but they take their chances. Are you surprised at the low numbers that enter drug court? Uh, to a certain extent. Um, I am. I think the uh, uh, there's some other issues there that, that I won't get into right now, but I think that we certainly uh, are available and willing to take on more people than we have. Yeah, that is. Anybody else before I? Oh. Sure. So you get the benefit of uh, following your, your, your classmates and, you know, seeing what the questions were that we sort of asked. <laughs> I think from our perspective of, you know, what can we do in, in this partnership? Um, the first thing I'll say is um, I uh, believe we first met uh, when you were a huge advocate for the safe uh, places, right? Um, we actually met before that. Do you, uh, if we can go back into the Wayback Machine, it, it would have been, uh, I believe, when I was here, and in, in your exact words, so I was with the Narcotics Task Force then working on a, a nuisance abatement program, mm -hmm. which uh, we did get up and running. And your, your story was, I think you were, had been some, a youth advocate or whatever at, yeah. a, at a party. A choice program. And you heard someone yell, look out, it's toasting. Oh, yeah. And everyone <laughs> ran out of the room, and your question to me was, what's a toasting? So, <laughs> well, anyway. that was, so that's that going was, back a few years. I was a caseworker at the time. Yeah. I was going to help a sixth grader with uh, his homework mm -hmm. in Nolan that's Village. Toasted. And... When I heard somebody yell, let's get out of here, it's toast, and I didn't know who Toastin was, so I took off running and was probably <laughs> running faster than half the guys that were running with me. Like so. running and then I realized, what am I running for? And it's like running from a bear. Yeah. As long as you're faster <laughs> than the next And time. I went back and figured out what a Toastin was. So, yeah, so anyway, so, yeah. but I think that's the first one. But I was a bunch of huge advocate also for Safe Place. I've represented the state's attorney's office, Safe Place, for seven years, trying every child abuse, infanticide, and, um, and molestation case. And I think that, and I'm just going to tell you personally, and I think that that's the moment I, I found myself uh, looking at you as, as a role model uh, for the community and, and for me as well. Um, and I say that because as conservative as your remarks are here with us today, you clearly have an interest in striking a balance between uh, uh, law and order and providing folks an opportunity to find that positive uh, outcome for themselves uh, in the community. And so I think that that speaks to your comments just a moment ago um, on the matter of individuals that, that, that choose to enter uh, uh, the drug uh, court program uh, and your uh, interest in, in seeing them through that program. Your interest is not in putting folks in jail. It's, it's, seeing folks, you know, become successful and, and uh, uh, in that, that sort of reentry process. Um, I think that one of the questions I had, and, you know, obviously you're aware sort of the, some of the impetus of doing this is the communication we received um, and the eight points that were generated uh, or provided through that communication. Um, and I think for, for your um, role uh, as uh, you know, a partner among the many folks that were identified um, uh, is uh, point number five, 
which uh, speaks to uh, some of the other comments and questions shared here, which um, says, you know, if the city would just end social services uh, in the city. Um, and, you know, when I hear you talk about uh, the drug court program, I think one of the things in my mind that I have curiosity about as it applies to the court's functions is, and I think it speaks to, to State's Attorney Sensei earlier when she said, you know, folks need to be able to get to the places they need to get to when they find themselves in those positions um, and, you know, proceed through the process of, of uh, the justice, uh, uh, you know, proceedings um, for, for whatever reason they find themselves there. And so I'm just curious, you know, because we, we've heard about the DJS earlier this evening, you know, DSS, all kinds of governmental entities that operate in our urban core no differently than, 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 than the court system does, you know, in the urban core. And so I'm just curious, maybe your thoughts on whether that would be a detriment to the ability for folks to go through the steps they need to go through as it applies to when they find themselves having to proceed through the legal system. Uh, in other words, you know, if you were, you know, if you were located, I don't know, uh, you know, all the way up Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, towards the PA line, I'm just trying to envision in my head. What are you talking about? The like how court folks would, being yeah, like, located? Like, well, maybe not just the court itself, but, you know, somebody having to go to DSS and somebody having to go to DJS and somebody having to go to any type of, of quote unquote nonprofit that operates in a very meshed way in the urban core already. I mean, that exists. And so I'm just trying to visualize in my mind what that would look like to sort of break up and disperse that across the county as an individual that would have to then, at some point, find themselves before you. Well, two things. One, uh, I have not read uh, the senator's letter. Uh, it was, I don't believe it was actually addressed to me. Was not. So I, I, I was not a res, did not receive it. I heard about it, uh, did not read it. So I'm not. I can glean the tenor of it from comments I've heard, but I've not actually seen the the body of it, and don't need to because that's not that's not a part of our bailiwick. Uh, and to your aunt, to your question, you know, to the extent there are, are significant political overtones here, I know Councilman Brini talked about. The, there are some politics involved and whatnot. Those are issues I'm not going to get into. Now, as a practical matter, uh, and this really would go more towards on the criminal side, probation, uh, courts, judges do order probations that often, uh, often require total abstention. And if you abstain, you have to also then go through evaluation, treatment, and testing. It's, it's a <coughs> specific condition on probation orders. And so for that to be a successful probationer, they would have to be able to attend, find and attend the programs that fit the bill. Mm -hmm. So what we do as a court and the requirements we may put on a criminal defendant who gets the benefit of a probation as opposed to incarceration, uh, I guess could be hampered depending on where, they, where that person lives and what their means are. Uh, from a lack of, of services, and, and we have seen that in the past when we first started drug court, and it wasn't a matter of where the services were, it's just a matter of what the services were. We did not have <coughs> what we truly needed to be, uh, to be successful. That has already changed. Uh, I mean, Brooks House, uh, you talk of something born of tragedy uh, for the betterment of a community. Brooks House has provided a lot of services that were not we're not here or at least provide them in a different manner. So the services you talk about are often necessary for the court to have a, a positive effect on uh, the people that come before us. I'm not gonna talk about where they are, where they're, they're situated, who's right about they should be here or should not be there because that's really not something uh, that, that is within our purview but having services for, for our probationers or other people to 
take advantage of so they can complete the requirements that are put on them is certainly very important. So the second question, and the same question that I think that I posed to the state's attorney's office is, given the communication and as you uh, indicate, you know, that was provided uh, solely and specifically to the city, uh, the body politic, meaning the mayor and council of the city of Hagerstown. Um, as I also indicated in our discussion uh, earlier, uh, it clearly indicated you know, a host of other parties that, that operate as partners in this governmental process that, that, that we collectively uh, have a responsibility to. Uh, and to that effect, um, you know, I tried to read the end of your report here where you discuss, uh, you know, sort of an outlook of needs, right? You know, right. Uh, as of last fall, yes. Well, well somebody with IT, like, and, and, and I, I felt that when I read that because there is this expect expectation that, you know, if you're managing a meeting or facilitating something, you should also be able to like do Zoom and all those other things at the same time. And you just, you can't wear all of those hats and effectively manage a meeting. That's a reality or facilitate a proceeding. Um, is there anything specifically uh, from your perspective? Uh, because again, this letter was directed to the city to reach out to say, hey, you know, City, you should do these things. Is there anything that we could look to your offices and say that that we could do, you know, uh, to assist in your uh, functions? Well, and you already do. Uh, you have to remember the courthouse is a combination of city, county, and state. Circuit courts are the responsibility of the county to construct, to maintain. Certain members of the staff our responsibility of the county to hire and to pay. And security for a circuit court is the responsibility of the sheriff in that jurisdiction. At the same time, uh, when a courthouse is located within a city, the city necessarily provides the parking, the opportunity for access, uh, whether it's the parking along the immediate streets necessary for our court security, and for our judges to park, because in old courthouses, you don't have parking lots. It just, it just doesn't, just wasn't considered back uh, 150 years ago. Or construction of new parking decks, which make it easier for, especially our, our jurors who come in, that's the largest group we have uh, at any one time. And as you know, jurors are selected at random, any age, any mobility. And for those who have difficulty with movement, having uh, public facilities close by is absolutely paramount. Uh, the county, of course, like I said, they provide that. They provide salaries, and the state provides uh, the bulk of the clerk's office, the uh, uh, certainly the judge's salaries, as well as the uh, a lot of the security upgrades through a grant program that the Maryland judiciary has created so that we can better protect all of those who come and use the courthouse. So I, I would say this, uh, you know, you already do your part. Uh, the new parking deck will make it much easier for our jurors. When the city lot, city market lot was sold, uh, we reached out to the city uh, because a lot of our jurors parked there. And uh, we were able to set up a voucher system so that our jurors, we will, our, the county agreed to pay uh, for a parking deck for the jurors that come in. Uh, and we agreed to uh, work with you to get a voucher system so it is a discounted rate uh, so that people of, Mar people of Washington County who, of course, pay the freight for all of this uh, would not be uh, burdened more than is absolutely necessary to make sure that our court functions continue. Uh, so, uh, you know, with IT and those things, that is supported by the state. This was sent to the state. Uh, that's who its real uh, reader is so that they know what we could do better to better and more efficiently run our courtrooms. Uh, so looking at something like uh, the IT component, we do have IT support. IT support can always be better or more uh, available just because Easy it, it's, it's that type of program where you, you need someone when you need them. Yeah. And uh, oh, yeah. when a computer doesn't start, you know. We'll have to gang you know. up on it. Well, I'll tell you, well, let me, no, I'll tell you, we had a, speaking truth, man. you know, we were greatly affected, as was the court system uh, statewide, when the 
you know, the great international blackout that happened mm -hmm. just a few Fridays ago. But uh, working hard, we had a, a group of volunteers, myself included. Uh, we met uh, two of our T folks on a Saturday afternoon. We spent four to six hours there, and we got every computer working by the time we left. So Monday, we were back open, and we were only partially shut down on Friday. Wow. So, I mean, it's there, but it takes effort. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is just more, you know, as, as our needs for more uh, audiovisual and digital uh, capabilities increases as more people use uh, ever, ever evolving uh, digital machines, we could always use more in the courtroom to make sure that we can present cases. So. You guys have any more questions? If I actually just, in a somewhat unrelated matter, Your Honor, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that well, I saw that you were there in front of the county commissioners uh, a couple of Tuesdays ago uh, requesting that if and when a new courthouse is developed in Washington County, um, that it be uh, named, I presume, at the, at the request or the, the request of, um, but of the family be named for Judge Andrew F. Wilkinson. And I think that was a uh, tremendous thing and I appreciate that you've done that in his honor. And I would say personally, and I think I speak for the count, mayor and council, that um, if and when that ever happens, the city stands ready to uh, do whatever we can to, to help facilitate uh, uh, a new and secure uh, and appropriately named facility. So thank sure. you for doing that. I appreciate that. And let me just clarify for the record, uh, though I was the one sitting there because my, my title, title requires it. Uh, that was a vote of all of the judges of the Circuit Court of Washington County. Judge Pollard in particular was, was uh, vehement that we conduct the renaming currently where we are to make sure it was never forgotten. Uh, the family was very interested in, in the future courthouse, if there is one, uh, named after him so that the county never forgets it. We are fortunately able to put both uh, of those uh, requirements into one ordinance. And, and as you saw, the county did, of course, approve that and are, are fast underway uh, developing the, the changes that will be made to the courthouse to reflect that decision. So it, it, I appreciate that. It was not me. It was the uh, it was us as a group. The collective you. The collective, the, uh, the court, thank circuit you. court. Judge, I just want to say that, um, just thank you. And uh, um, my work uh, with mediation um, has, um, I'm very passionate about it. And so whenever uh, the, the comment was made the separate, that we have to maintain separate government functions, um, one of the hardest things for me was to be a part of the elected body and know that I was at the table for the day reporting center as a mediator. Um, chief was then captain. I believe that's how far back those conversations go, but you were also at the table, mm -hmm. um, as well as, again, drug court. You know, drug court being um, something that I uh, loved coming to, not because you gave out candy bars, um, <laughs> but because it was, um, it was very empowering. Um, but I attempted to do those things as the mayor of the city, and it just did not, it just did not work out right. Um, I attempted to stay kind of involved in that. And what was happening with that was I was getting a lot of police called on me um, because of the, the, the wanting to be a part of the restorative part, but then also being the mayor of the city. Mm -hmm. And so I just thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, the frustration that I have a lot of times of being this, this, this person that is trained, um, you know, to, to hear and understand is being able to uh, be the CEO of the city and, and understand from the top down how important it is, um, but then also my grassroots work from the bottom up. Um, and so thank you for all the work uh, that you do. Um, I'm thankful that the alternative dispute resolution um, for the self-help, and I just have to say, I, I used to take those days, Monday and Tuesday, as a mediator and answer those calls for the entire state of Maryland. And I don't think that a lot of people understand um, the parts that mediators can play in community um, and how we help with public safety and how we help save money across the state. 
um, just to know that Washington County was a part of the self-help and then to have mediators mm -hmm. here being able to do that heavy lifting for the city. So I, that was just my spill hmm. of all the things. I mean, we've gone from facilitating character counts, um, things together uh, to, you know, um, me being the mayor of the city and you sitting across as the judge sure. and the work still continues. So thank you. It does. I thank you.